Firstly, I'd like to thank the NCI UFAR committee for inviting me to give this keynote lecture dedicated to Professor Paul Van Hoot. Uh, today I'm going to share with you some of the work that we've been doing in my laboratory exploring the functional significance of the non-canonical pathway for NO synthesis and my focus is particularly on the cardiovascular system. But before I do this, I thought that perhaps we could reminisce uh, a little about the major contributions that Professor Paul Van Hoot has made to the cardiovascular research world. Um, he was an enormously prolific researcher. Uh, he published over 670 original articles, absolutely mammoth feat, and uh, somewhere in the region of 570 editorials, reviews, uh, chapters of books and, and edited books. These publications fell into uh, three main areas of research within the cardiovascular field. He was one of the uh, earliest researchers uh, that identified the importance of dysfunction of the endothelium in cardiovascular disease. Um, he also led the field in terms of uh, appreciating the existence of the endothelium-derived hyperpolarizing factor, EDHF, but also expanding our understanding of the mechanisms of its um, biological activity. And in fact, this, this image here on the right is the front cover of a book that was published in 1996. It was the first of the EDHF books that uh, Paul Van Hoot compiled. And this is a book that I actually have on my shelf in my office. It's very well thumbed. Um, and uh, and it's still, I still use it today. Um, and then the third area where he made major contributions was, of course, uh, a term that he coined, endothelium-derived contracting factor. And, and this work is work that um, he conducted in the la latter part of his um, research uh, time, mostly while he was at Hong Kong. This is an interesting area of research because what it did is it challenged our uh, some of our preconceptions. We often consider that endothelial dysfunction, so loss of the beneficial and positive effects of the endothelium, uh, is key in the development of cardiovascular disease. There's no question that that's true. But what's also the case is that the endothelium has a capacity not only to make protective mediators, but also to generate factors that likely contribute to the pathogenesis and pathology of disease. And, and Professor Van Hoot described this endothelium-derived contracting factor, uh, and in particular his focus was on arachidonic metabolites. And so, I mean, his contributions were massive, uh, a real giant uh, in the field. And as, as someone who is an independent researcher working on exploring vascular responses and vascular reactivity, I was massively uh, flattered and gratified um, when this book came out in uh, 2005 and actually included uh, a review of all the EDHF advances, and that included some of the, the publications that uh, some of the discoveries that I'd made. He he shared he discussed the work that we did demonstrating that EDHF was the predominant vasodilator in the uh, resistance vasculature of females, but he also um, discussed uh, the findings that. Uh, uh, the lead researcher was Adrian Hobbs, and I worked very closely with him on this, that C-type natriuretic peptide might also be functioning as an EDHF. And, and this part, this theory, even made it into the famous cartoons that he used in, in many of his reviews. So definitely a giant in the field. He will be sorely missed, but he leaves a really strong legacy. Many of the individuals that he trained in his labs um, these individuals are now uh, independent researchers leading their own labs uh, across the globe. So, uh, we know that nitric oxide produced tonically by the cardiovascular system plays an absolutely critical role in sustaining cardiovascular health by inducing an array of positive effects on uh, various elements of the circulation and uh, uh, cardiovascular organs. But what we also know, of course, and this is work that um, uh, Paul Van Hoot contributed to, is that there is this dysfunction 
of the endothelium and that a key characteristic of that dysfunction is a loss of the activity and even decreased expression of the key uh, isoform of nitric oxide synthase that is, is responsible for tonic NO generation. But what we also know is that many of these cardiovascular diseases are characterized by a, uh, an oxidative stress that results in the generation of reactive oxygen species that, in addition, will scavenge NO. And so together, this dysfunction of the canonical pathway and the scavenging of NO lead to a reduction in the bioavailability of nitric oxide and a loss of this protective profile. Um, the half-life of nitric oxide is also very short, which is why you need the continuous NO release. It's about a, a well, it's somewhere in the region of about six and a half seconds. And this is because nitric oxide binds avid, avidly to heme-containing proteins. And in the circulation, of course, there is a lot of the heme-containing protein hemoglobin. And NO actually binds with, very, uh, with hemoglobin very avidly. It's a very fast reaction to generate nitrate and uh, NO3 minus and met haemoglobin. NO will also bind with molecular oxygen, but it's a really slow reaction. Uh, and it, when it does this, it, will ge it generates nitrite anion, NO2 minus, but NO2 minus also binds with oxyhemoglobin to make even more nitrate and met haemoglobin. So if you go into a healthy, look in a healthy individual in their blood, you find somewhere in the region of 20 to 30 micromolar nitrate and 0 0.1 to 0 0.3 micromolar nitrite. And this hundredfold difference between the two, in part a reflection of the um, predominance of the metabolism directly to nitrate in the body. Now... What we've realized over the past 10, 15 years that rather than representing a unidirectional termination pathway, that actually under the certain conditions in the right environment, both of these anions actually can be chemically reduced all the way back to NO in the body. And those of us who work in the field are, uh, are enormously excited by this possibility because it offers us the possibility of delivering NO to the cardiovascular system that is completely independent of the dysfunctional canonical pathway. We're not trying to correct this. And in fact, all attempts to correct this have failed clinically for the treatment of chronic cardiovascular disease. Here, we're just replacing the lost NO and in that way, uh, recovering the, the profile of activity of the uh, healthy levels of, of tonic NO that would normally be generated. Now, there are two steps in this metabolism pathway. The first step, I'm not actually going to speak about a great deal in this talk, but um, and I'm happy to answer questions later at the end, but um, nitrate in the body is actually, it is inert in, our, in mammals. We don't really express any nitrate reductases, but what we now know is that there are bacteria that have colonized parts of our body, particularly the oral cavity, that will use nitrate as a substrate and convert nitrate to nitrite. Uh, this nitrite, once it's converted, it, it, it um, collects in the saliva and of course when you swallow, swallow your saliva, that saliva then can enter the body again and some of that enters the circulation. And when it's in the circulation, what we now know, there are numerous uh, mammalian nitrite reductases that can convert that nitrite to nitric oxide. And in this talk, I'm actually going to share with you some of our ideas about what, what is primarily responsible uh, at this stage. Now, really, the first demonstration that nitrite might be useful in the cardiovascular system, or not even useful, but biologically function, had a biological function, came from work um, published by Jay Spire in, in 1995. Um, Jay Spire was interested in what happened to NO in um, the heart during an ischemic episode. So what, what happens to NO... Uh, in a myocardial infarction. The reason he was interested is because we knew that NOS needs oxygen. So presumably we would lose the NO signal. So he took isolated rat Langendorf hearts, he treated them with, um, uh, um, uh, he subjected them to a global ischemia and uh, also treated them with an NO spin trap and then uh, homogenized those tissues and, and looked for NO using EPR spectroscopy. Um, so this first uh, trace here, A, is actually a heart that was subjected to normoxia. 
and the, um, the spectra here uh, uh, show very little NO, and this is because um, in an oxygenated environment, NO is very rapidly um, metabolized. So you would expect this, you would expect a very low signal. This is a heart that was subjected to global ischemia, and actually this was the observation that stunned uh, Jay's wire. So this is a typical EPR spectra for NO. And um, so this is in a heart that uh, is subjecting to global ischemia and one would have thought the NO signal would have disappeared. Now to determine how much of this might be related to NOS activity that was still functional, he treated hearts with the NOS inhibitor, uh, with a NOS inhibitor, but you can still see that there's still uh, an NO signal that's evident here that is substantially higher than in, in normoxia. And what he discovered is that um, actually the heart tissue contains really high concentrations of nitrite, uh, somewhere in the region of about 20 to 30 micromolar. And that's a surprise, because if you remember I told you that there's somewhere between 0.1 and 0.3 micromolar within the circulation. But not only that, he discovered that during the hypoxia, uh, the period of the uh, global ischemia, that the pH within the myocardium dropped substantially down to pH 5.5. And he reasoned that this resulted in a chemical acidification of nitrite um, that then released nitric oxide and that this was responsible for this NO signal. Now, curiously, what he didn't do in this study is go on to work out what the, the functional significance of this nitrite might be. And that's where um, my group entered the field. And actually, to be honest, if anything, he suggested that this nitrite-derived NO might be damaging to the heart. Well, this is work that my postdoc at the time, Peter McLean, did uh, together with the uh, help of a clinical pharmacologist who was doing his PhD with me at the time, Andy Webb. And uh, what they did is they subjected rat Langerdorf heart preps to a typical, a fairly standard ischemia reperfusion insult. And the reason we did an ischemia reperfusion injury is because we wanted to simulate better what might be happening in the clinical setting. So uh, when a patient presents with an acute myocardial infarct, they've already suffered their ischemic insult. There's nothing that you can do about that. You can't roll back time. But what we need to, what needs to happen then is they need to have their uh, blocked coronary artery opened and a stent inserted. And this is critical to enable survival. But of course, what also happens is that there's a second wave of injury that is caused by the reperfusion. And um, essentially what we were doing in this, in this model is looking to see whether nitrite might be beneficial. And you can see quite clearly here that when we infused hearts during the ischemic period with, either, um, with concentrations of nitrite that straddle the levels that Jay's wire measured in heart tissue, that we uh, substantially attenuated infarct size. We know that this effect of nitrite is due to its conversion to NO because when we co-infused the um, uh, nitrite with this NO scavenger carboxy-PTIO, uh, the beneficial effect was completely lost. Um, what we also did in these experiments, and I haven't shown the graph here, is that we, uh, rather than treat just during the ischemia, we also gave the nitrite just prior to reperfusion and we found a similar level of, of protection. And that's actually more relevant for the clinical setting. But what we also did is we looked to see where that nitrite reduction might be taking place. And we took isolated hearts and we sampled the NO that was being generated by the heart and measured it using chemiluminescence. And this shows a heart subjected to ischemia reperfusion injury. And this shows a heart in which we had actually selectively removed the endothelium using a detergent protocol. And you can see that there's a profound suppression of the uh, NO generated from nitrite in the setting. This is in response to nitrite infusion. And this indicated that the NO that was being generated here that was protective was um, uh, a large proportion of it was actually coming from nitrite reduction taking place at the endothelium. Well, very soon after our uh, paper was published, uh, Mark Gladwin and David Leffer published their findings uh, using an in vivo model of ischemia reperfusion injury in mice, and they administered nitrite 
30 minutes prior to reperfusion. It says IV here, but actually it's intraventricular. But you can see that here too, nitrite causes dose-dependent reduction of infarct size. And since those observations, um, there have been numerous studies in various organs showing that nitrite, the efficacy of nitrite, at least within the ischemia reperfusion setting, uh, falls in a therapeutic range of somewhere between 3 and 100 micromolar. We start to lose the beneficial activity above these concentrations and we don't see any cytoprotection at lower concentrations, but that this activity can be evidenced in whatever organ is being subjected to an IR injury. And finally, the evidence suggests that whilst nitrite, raising circulating levels of nitrite, uh, can exert some cytoprotection, that the greatest protective activity is always evident when nitrite is given locally um, at the level of the organ where the ischemia reperfusion is taking place and that this biological activity requires the nitrite to be there prior to reperfusion. Well actually the field moved really fast uh, these publications 2004-2005 and less than 10 years later uh, we had um, two clinical trials that reported in the literature. These references show the protocol paper and then the outcome paper for both. This is a trial that was run by Michael Freneau in Aberdeen, and this is the trial that we did at, at BARTS, and I did this with my um, collaborator, uh, Anthony Mather, a senior consultant cardiologist, and uh, a cardiologist who was doing a PhD with us at the time, Dan Jones. Now, both of these studies actually use sodium nitrite um, uh, in patients who had suffered an ST elevated myocardial infarct. Um, Michael decided to give a five minute infusion in his study and this was based upon a study actually that had been done in dogs by Mark Gladwin showing that with this protocol that the circulating levels of nitrite could be raised to uh, approximately six micromolar, so within the therapeutic range. What we did in our study actually was to directly administer the um, same concentrations, uh, uh, concentration of nitrite that we gave in the rat Langendorf study, somewhere around 10 micromolar locally, but we administered it as a bolus down the catheter that um, was going to be used for balloon angioplasty and prior to balloon inflation and um, beyond the actual blockage. So the nitrite was there present beyond the blockage prior to reperfusion uh, and infused here. Now, um, sadly, I have to tell you that neither of these studies were positive for the primary outcomes. The MRI here in Michaels and, and CK as a surrogate measure uh, for infarct size. However, um, we did actually have um, uh, further secondary outcomes in our study. Um, we followed our patients up for three years following the intervention and whilst the um, results were massively disappointing, um, we still pursued um, our investigations. And actually um, the results that we got were surprising. So this shows major adverse um, cardiac events and this is defined as death due to cardiac related events, myocardial infarction, recurrent vasculation and heart failure. So what you see here is the outcome in the placebo limb and you can see that following the intervention, so all of these patients are treated with the balloon and the stent and they also receive sodium chloride for the placebo. And you can see that there are a number of events that take place in the first year and then actually we see nothing but in the final year you start to see more events. This is a typical profile of what happens to patients normally. So within three years, 25% of the patients who've received PCI and a stent will have had a further event. And um, But what really surprised us is that in the nitrite limb, you can see that there's clear blue water between the two interventions. So there are two questions here that then um, uh, arise as a consequence of this data. We have to remember that this wasn't a powered outcome. This is just a, an exploratory outcome that we pursued really because I wanted to have some in-house data to power a phase three study off. But the two questions are, firstly, 
Perhaps infarct size is not a good surrogate measure for cardio protection studies. And actually, there, there may be some real truth in that. Uh, almost every um, intervention that's been tested in cardio protection studies has used infarct size as the outcome measure. None of them have been positive. Um, so maybe uh, infarct size is not a good surrogate of the hard outcomes that the patient actually experiences. This is what the patient experiences. The patient could care less what their infarct size is. Um, but secondly, if it's not that we're influencing infarct size, what is it that we're doing here? Well, of course, we know that NO inhibits inflammation. And uh, what we know about reperfusion injury is that upon reperfusion, there's a massive inflammatory response that then contributes to the second wave of damage that's caused by reperfusion. And actually, the level of inflammation caused by that second wave is something that was looked at by um, Silliman many years ago uh, in this large study. They had just over a thousand patients. All of them received treatment for their ST elevated myocardial infarct. Um, but what also happened at that time is that the circulating levels of HSCRP were measured. And they divided those levels of CRP into tertiles. And the, in a healthy individual, the levels of HSCRP are somewhere below two mg per litre. And so the lowest tertile here is, is, is set at five. Before, we could only measure uh, as low as five mg per litre. So this is why um, five was the bottom tertile. But what they found is that with increasing levels of HSCRP, the uh, risk of death following their treatment substantially increased. So the higher your inflammatory burden, the worse your outcome. So we wondered whether um, this large local dose of nitrite within the culprit artery might in fact be inhibiting that second wave of inflammation. And so first of all, we measured the levels of the HSCRP in, in, the, um, in the blood. Uh, and you can see at baseline when the patients arrived in hospital in both the limbs that they had almost identical HSCRP levels and that these are high. So they fall into this region here, which is considered, it, it's here, it's a medium, but this is a high level. Anything above five is considered high. Um, so these came in about 10 mg per litre. But then following reperfusion, if you look in the placebo limb, you can see there's this substantial rise in HSCRP levels and that this rise is, is completely absent in, in those who receive nitrite. And then at 24 hours, we can see that it still is continuing to rise. So this is a really strong inflammatory insult, the reperfusion. And it's still being suppressed by, um, in the individuals who were treated with nitrite. Interestingly, at six months, you can see that whilst the levels have come back down, in the placebo limb, they're still raised. They're well above five um, uh, mg per litre. Whereas in contrast here, in the nitrite-treated patients, actually the levels were just sitting at two, so potentially considered healthy. Well, we wanted to have a look at whether um, this change in inflammation was associated with change in uh, differences in the circulating leukocytes, and actually you can see that this second wave of inflammation is really here, clear here. We get this profound neutrophilia. We also get changes in lymphocyte and monocyte numbers over the course of this period, but we found that the nitrite treatment had no impact upon those numbers at all. But here you can clearly see that this neutrophilia doesn't occur and that this difference is maintained out to six months. What we also found is that not only was the neutrophilia prevented, but also the activation of neutrophils locally at the point of reperfusion, which is the critical step in inducing the respiratory burst. And you can see here quite clearly that in the nitrite limb that most definitely we'd reduced the um, activation of the cells reflected by CD11B expression. I should say that this was a rather selective effect. We looked at a whole host of activation markers on all different leukocyte subtypes. The only one that was affected was CD11B and only on neutrophils, not on any other cell types. 
I have some ideas about what's taking place here, but I'm happy to discuss this later with anybody who's interested. Okay, so um, what we have found uh, is that um, actually, if we if we deliver nitrite in the acute setting um, and relatively high concentrations of nitrite, not within the general circulation but lo locally, that this might be a useful approach to take in the treatment of acute disease. And it does this by prob by inducing an array of different NO profiles including primarily anti-inflammatory, but we also have evidence that there's an anti-thrombotic effect too, as well as being cytoprotective. So then, of course, the question comes is that, okay, so you can use nitrite for the treatment of acute disease, but what about chronic disease? We know that raised systemic inflammation is key in the uh, progression of atherosclerotic, but also hypertensive disease. And it, could it be possible that raising circulating nitrite levels might actually improve outcome in this setting? And this is where it gets complicated. And it's complicated because nitrite actually has uh, a short half-life too. Um, not seconds. Uh, whether nitrite is administered orally or intraparentally, it's got a half-life of somewhere around 30, 30 minutes. And actually what we know is that if, we want to use nitrite to provide sustained elevation of nitrite levels within the circulation that we have to actually infuse very high concentrations of nitrite into the individual and that this needs to be an infusion it needs uh, an invasive approach and of course this is ridiculous for um, uh, a ridiculous concept for the therapeutics of chronic cardiovascular disease. But what's also true, and it was published in this paper, is that because of the need to continuously infuse high concentrations of nitrite to achieve biologically active levels of nitrite within the circulation, um, this results in um, an increase in the levels of methemoglobin. And so you start to actually move to dangerous territory. So we wondered if we could take advantage of the fact that nitrate can be converted by oral bacteria uh, to elevate circulating nitrite levels as a mechanism to provide sustained elevation of circulating nitrite. And this is actually data that we published. Um, it's work that we did in Healthy Volunteers. We gave them a rather large dose of potassium nitrate, but I think it... it, it um, exemplifies what one can do. So a single dose, so the individuals took a single dose orally of nitrate at time point zero, and you can see this is plasma nitrite concentration, that there's a slow rise, it peaks at around two and a half to three hours, but it remains elevated for up to 24 hours. So a single dose of nitrite providing sustained elevation of circulating nitrite levels. The question is, is this kind of elevation enough for biological function? So we're seeing somewhere about a doubling of circulating nitrite levels. Um, and these are levels that we know at a systemic level are safe. They're not going to cause significant methemoglobinemia. So we decided to take this approach. First of all, um, I'm going to share with you the work that we did in atherosclerosis. Uh, this is work that a postdoc in my lab did at the time. Uh, he's now a lecturer, actually, I'm happy to say, um, Raymond. And what he did is he put potassium nitrate or potassium chloride in the drinking water. And the animals then ingested the nitrate and we did a whole host of studies and showed that nitrate levels went up and circulating nitrite levels went up too. And he looked at the impact of these two interventions on APOE knockout mice, mice fed either a normal chow diet or a high fat diet. And I have to tell you that this, the whole story was actually five years worth of work. And... Um, at the end of all of that, to get a picture like this is, is I have to say, soul destroying. So I think you can see quite clearly, there's the oil red O staining. There's absolutely no difference between um, the nitrate and chloride fed animals in either of these two 
groups. And uh, just to hammer this home, uh, here's a, a blow up of the aortic arch region. So absolutely no difference in plaque. So at first we thought, oh my goodness, all that time and it hasn't worked. What was even worse about this study is that somebody published before us uh, this paper came out in 2016. Honestly, it was, as I said, soul-destroying. However, um, what we also know is that um, within the plaque region, that is where we can actually focus on looking at the level of inflammation. And inflammation is key uh, to determining whether uh, a plaque becomes something that leads to an event or, or, in fact, if it's stable enough, then we don't see an event. And so what we did is we took the plaque regions and we stained for inflammation using a fairly standard approach of looking at inflammation in an atherosclerotic part, the level of MAC2 expression, macrophage expression. And you can see quite clearly here that the level of expression was significantly attenuated, both whether the animals had normal chow diet or a high-fed diet. And this was associated, at least in high-fat diet-fed animals, with an increase in smooth muscle actin within the plaque region. So essentially what we had done is we had converted unstable plaque into a stable plaque phenotype by inhibiting inflammation within the plaque region. Well, we wanted to try and understand exactly what about inflammation we were impacting upon with the nitrate treatment. And so we used intravital microscopy just to get an idea about what baseline rolling was in the APOE knockout fed nitrate or chloride. And you can see quite clearly here that for sure we had a lower burden of activated circulating leukocytes, lower rolling and roller, lower adhesion. And when we took APOE knockouts that hadn't been fed either potassium chloride or potassium nitrite and superfused nitrite over the mesenteric circulation um, that was being visualised in the intravital microscopy, we saw a concentration-dependent reduction of leukocyte rolling and leukocyte adhesion in response to nitrite. So clearly we were impacting leukocyte activation, adherence and uh, potentially then margination. Now to look at this a little bit more closely we decided to use TNF-alpha which is a prominent cytokine involved in the inflammatory process associated with um, uh, leukocyte recruitment in the um, uh, in the atherosclerotic um, uh, disease state and we injected the TNF-alpha intraperitoneally and then uh, washed the peritoneal out and um, counted cells but also conducted flow cytometry. And you can see quite clearly that with potassium nitrate treatment we reduced the number of cells marginating into the peritoneum and that this was driven largely by a reduction in neutrophil numbers um, uh, into the peritoneum. We also measured uh, the levels of inflammatory monocyte and showed that uh, they were reduced too and I haven't shown that data here. But we wanted to determine whether whether was this inhibition of neutrophil uh, margination into the peritoneal cavity uh, essentially telling us that the step of margination was being prevented by the nitrate treatment or is it possible that even just leukocyte adherence, um, particularly from our intravital microscopy, might also be affected? And indeed, when we took the mesenteries out and um, looked at MPO activity, and MPO is localised um, predominantly to just neutrophils, you can see there's a, a substantial decrease here. And this is telling us that there were less neutrophils actually adherent in the mesenteric circulation too. And interestingly, much like the study in our patients, our STEMI patients, we showed that the neutrophil activation state was reduced and that this was particularly associated with the reduction in CD11B uh, expression. I can tell you that we looked as we did in the human study, the patient study, at uh, all the different cell types and um, CD11B was reduced only on the neutrophil and not on any other cell type. Um, so I think um, I've shown you that it's quite clear that uh, the that nitrate can be used to elevate nitrite, circulating nitrite, but then that nitrite is reduced to NO and this produces an anti-inflammatory profile of activity. 
but um, what is the mammalian nitrite reductase that might be responsible for this activity? Well, um, if you remember, Jay's Vire suggested that it was the chemical acidification in the ischemia that was responsible for the reduction of nitrite to nitric oxide. But I've just shown you a whole load of data where we haven't got ischemia, that actually we have an animal with disease, but we're not making, not causing ischemia in that setting. And, and that is because it's become quite clear that there are numerous mammalian nitrite reductases that actually facilitate nitrite reduction. Um, the, there has been a great deal of research in the role of the globins in facilitating nitrite reduction. The work of Mark Gladwin and Danny Kim Shapiro really highlighting the role of deoxyhemoglobin as a primary nitrite reductase. A lot of Mark's work has shown that nitrite reduction is taking place within the blood, within the circulation um, uh, uh, rather than actually within the tissue of the blood vessel. But um, he and many others have gone on to look at the other globins and shown similar nitrite reductase activity of the deoxy for, of all of these globins. There are a number of other um, protein um, uh, nitrite reductases that have been identified but actually I'm going to talk to you about the molybdenum binding enzymes and particularly about xanthine oxidoreductase, reductase which is the work that my laboratory um, uh, and the work that my laboratory has done on this. So um, xanthine oxidoreductase reductase is actually one of a um, group of four proteins that exist within mammals that are molybdenum binding and I know that you guys like to, to um, uh, see these things, so I'm sharing this information with you. It's actually really interesting. So we don't actually have very many molybdenum binding enzymes. We're, we're not like bacteria. Bacteria have loads of molybdenum binding enzymes, but we only have four. We have xanthine oxidoreductase, which is actually found in very, very high levels in the liver, but is also found within the intestine. Um, we have aldehyde oxidase, which is a closely related um, enzyme, and again, this is intracellular. And then there's sulfite oxidase, which is actually found within the intermembrane space. And then there's um, mitochondrial amidoxamine uh, reductase C1, and that is, is, is found uh, primarily within the mitochondria. And you can see that these are related proteins but have slightly different structures and different localizations. All of these enzymes have been shown to reduce nitrite to nitric oxide. Anyway, I'm interested in XOR, and XOR is a really interesting protein. It's got four subunits, the molybdenum binding subunit, which is the site where purine catabolism takes place, and that's probably what you know this enzyme best for. Um, there are two iron sulfurs, and they're really key because they allow electrons to move from one end of the enzyme to the other. And there's a flavin site, and this site, uh, you'll know it because it's the site at which superoxide is generated and hydrogen peroxide from, from uh, when it uses oxygen as a substrate. The enzyme exists in two forms, uh, xanthine dehydrogenase, and when it's dehydrogenase, it uses NADH as a substrate, a reducing substrate, um, and a xanthine oxidase form, and it's in the exo form that it will use uh, oxygen. But in the early 2000s, both Roger Harrison's group in Bath, but also again Jay Zwire, showed that purified uh, XOR could in fact bring about the one electron reduction of nitrite to nitric oxide. So back in that uh, study that we did in the, in the um, isolated rat heart, we looked at the capacity of NO generation by those rat Langendorf hearts. What we did is we sampled the airspace around the heart, which is really cool, and you can measure that using chemiluminescence. And we subjected the heart to ischemia, and you can see, and we infused increasing concentrations of nitrite here. And you can see that we cause a concentration uh, dependent generation of NO from nitrite that falls back down to baseline as soon as we restore oxygen tension. And that when we treated the heart with this really effective inhibitors of the enzyme, that we um, uh, abolished uh, the signal that we could pick up. This isn't just a phenomenon that's shown in rat hearts. We also did similar experiments um, 
and this just shows the quantification of it using homogenates of human atrial appendage. Here we showed about 50% of the response was inhibited when we treated with uh, XOR. The work of Shruti Shiva and Tunu Shrasav has suggested that uh, deoxymyoglobin is probably responsible for the rest of the nitrite reductase activity in, in, in um, the heart. But if you remember, I, I told you that Mark Ladman's work has suggested that uh, not only do we see nitrite reduction at the level of the endothelium, remember I told you that this was an endothelial phenomenon, but that there's a great deal of nitrite reduction that takes place within the circulation, within the circulating elements and, and at the level of the red blood cell, the erythrocyte. Um, I, I mentioned in the previous slide that the primary site of um, generation of XOR is actually the liver. And what happens in situations of stress is that the liver dumps XOR into the circulation. It circulates around and actually binds to glycosaminoglycans, which are expressed on the endothelium. And um, once it's bound, it can then uh, express XOR activity. Well, we actually looked around and I discovered that erythrocytes express GAGs too. And so we did some immunohistochemistry um, on erythrocytes purified from individuals undergoing coronary artery bypass grafting. And you can see quite clearly here with this antibody that there appears to be expression of XOR on the membrane of the erythrocyte. And when we take those erythrocytes and look at NO generating capacity, we show that when we add nitrite that we substantially increase NO generation when we um, uh, subject the, uh, the erythrocytes here we've done used acidosis and that when we give xanthine as a reducing substrate to provide electrons that we can increase this response and then if we inhibit this, this um, um, enzyme by treating with allopurinol we can profoundly attenuate that response. Well, we wondered if this might also be the case in a model of atherosclerosis um, because that was in the ischemic hearts where there's acidosis, but what about under normal physiological pH? Um, and actually what we discovered in both the livers and the erythrocyte that, uh, that, um, that uh, the, there is an increase in the expression of XOR in the APOE knockout versus wild type litimate controls. Uh, and this is true both in the liver but also uh, on XOR that's bound to erythrocytes. And that this increased expression is reflected by increased nitrite reductase activity. Here we're increasing the concentration of nitrite that we're subjecting to erythrocytes and measuring uh, NO. And what we also found is that when we treated those erythrocytes from the APOE knockout, um, with allopurinol that we could significantly attenuate the nitrite reductase activity in both liver homogenates and um, in erythrocytes. This is work done uh, by my PhD student at the Times of Bonnegosh and a postdoc visiting uh, me from Granada University, Isabel Fuentes Calvo. Um, so uh, there is this growing paradigm now actually that suggests that um, uh, that we have a, a number of different nitrite reductases that that um, play uh, a role in in nitrite reduction dependent upon the environmental conditions that when we elevate circulating levels of nitrite in health it there the evidence does suggest that it is predominantly um, deoxyhemoglobin that is acting as a nitrite reductase and potentially some of these other candidates too. But as we move into a disease scenario, whether it be reduced oxygen tension, reduced pH or simply atherosclerotic disease, that there is an upregulation of XOR expression that can be evidenced on the erythrocyte and endothelium and that this starts to take over nitrite reduction. Um, so um, the last part of my talk, I'm just going to share with you some of the study that we've been doing in hypertension. Um, and uh, well, what I said to you is that in a healthy individual, the circulating levels of nitrate are somewhere between 20 and 30 micromolar. And this is in part a reflection of the metabolism of 
of NO. But nitrate levels actually come from two sources, not just the oxidative metabolism of NO, but it also actually comes from the diet. We consume vast quantities of nitrate whenever we eat vegetables, in actual fact. And um, uh, there was work that came from Yoon Lundberg and Eddie Reitzberg many years ago showing that if they asked their healthy volunteers to eat a whole head of lettuce that they could raise circulating nitrate levels. Um, I wanted to look at the possibility that we could use nitrate to elevate circulating nitrite and in this way actually lower blood pressure. Um, and I thought the idea of asking my volunteers to eat a head of lettuce was a bit much and I looked for an alternative and that's when I discovered that beetroots have a very high nitrate content. So I got healthy volunteers to um, drink quite a lot of beetroot juice. It had a very high nitrate content at the time. But you can see quite clearly that this single dose of inorganic nitrate caused a dose-dependent decrease in systolic blood pressure, peaking at around the two and a half to uh, systolic blood pressure, about two and a half to three hour time point, and this effect being sustained out to 24 hours. We see a similar pro profile with diastolic blood pressure, and this was amazing. Single dose of inorganic nitrate, sustained lowering of blood pressure, and this decrease in blood pressure correlated directly with the rise in circulating nitrite levels. And actually with Vikas Kapil, I've gone on to do a whole range of other studies. We show that the blood pressure lowering effect is dose dependent. We can uh, see this effect whether we use potassium nitrate salt or whether we use the dietary intervention. In healthy volunteers, we identified four millimoles as a threshold dose. Um, this raises nitrate levels and nitrite levels slightly, but actually has very limited blood pressure lowering activity in a healthy person and four millimoles is actually the ADI. Um, we found that the higher resting blood pressure, the greater the blood pressure lowering effect of, of, of any dose of, of nitrate. And this is true of any antihypertensive. Um, interestingly, we found that women process dietary nitrate better than men, and hey, that's not a surprise. This is just another, another characteristic of women that um, is superior. And then we also demonstrated that um, actually endogenous nitrate that comes from the oxidative metabolism of NO, that also enters the enterosalivary circuit and that this also contributes to um, resting blood pressure and actually that circulating nitrite levels, um, they reflect direct nitrite reductase activity in controlling blood pressure too. Um, so what about hypertension? Well, um, with Kristen Bubb, who was a postdoc in my lab at the time, we wanted to just make sure that nitrite could lower blood pressure in hypertension. So we went to the SHR and we found that nitrite causes dose-dependent decreases in blood pressure in the spontaneously hypertensive rat. It is a, a blood pressure lowering drug in the Wister Quixote, but actually uh, much less potent. Um, and what's also true about hypertension, as is true for atherosclerosis, is that there's an upregulation of XOR expression. So actually what um, Kristen did is she uh, treated the SHRs um, with allopurinol and uh, looked at the response to nitrite. And you can see quite clearly here that uh, allopurinol inhibited the blood pressure lowering effects of nitrite, suggesting that in hypertension that there is an increased potency of nitrite uh, activity. So we decided to look at inorganic nitrate to deliver nitrite in patients with essential hypertension, and these were stage one uh, hypertension, but we took a massive risk, and this is work that Vikas Kapil did with me when he was doing his PhD. We decided to use a dose of nitrate that was um, was below the threshold dose uh, for efficacy in in healthy volunteers, and we reasoned that in these hypertensive patients, hopefully, we'll have increased XOR activity and so increased biological activity. And it was a gamble, but it paid off. Here you can see that we see a uh, uh, time-dependent decrease in blood pressure, very much like the response that we saw in the healthy volunteers, but we're using a dose that is substantially lower, the, 
uh, results I showed you previously were with 24 millimoles. This is with uh, three and a half millimoles. So um, that was a gamble that paid off, uh, but Vic went on to do a longer term study where we gave once a day a daily dose of uh, dietary nitrate to um, 64 uh, hypertensive patients and this was an equal number of stratification of stage one and stage two individuals not reaching target blood pressure and you can see the differences in their blood pressures here but we were fortunate enough to actually get our hands on a really great placebo and this is where uh, we have nitrate extracted from commercial supplies of beetroot juice so this was a double blind um, uh, phase two clinical study. We had a two week um, run-in period, four weeks once daily, followed by a two week washout. And this actually shows the home blood pressure uh, readings and each dot is uh, an average of one week's blood pressure measurements that the patients made by themselves at home, uh, essentially to eliminate white coat. And you can see quite clearly here with systolic blood pressure that um, the two-week run-in stays the same, but as soon as the individuals who are on the nitrate-containing beetroot juice um, start consuming it, their blood pressure comes down, and this is sustained for the entire duration that they're taking the intervention. And we start to see blood pressure returning back to baseline uh, during the two-week um, washout. Um, and this is some unpublished data at the moment. I thought it might be interesting for the focus on fibrosis. Um, and this is a, uh, has come from a clinical trial that we're currently running at the moment called Nitrate TOD. And this is where we're giving nitrate, dietary nitrate to patients with um, uh, left ventricular hypertrophy. We're stratified our patients into, they, they all have hypertension, but half have uh, LVH, cardiac hypertrophy, and half don't. And what's really interesting, so you can see that the patients with LVH have um, uh, a greater left ventricular mass, and this is assessed using MRI. Uh, and this is associated with uh, reduced levels of circulating uh, nitrite, and this lower levels of circulating nitrite, I believe, is due to the fact that they have a worst, uh, worse endothelial function. So actually what we're doing in our trial is we're giving back nitrate to these patients to see if we can recover this, recover that, and perhaps impact upon cardiac hypertrophy. What's interesting here is that using um, some really clever methods developed by James Moon, who we're working with, we've been able to assess fibrosis in the myocardium, and it does look as though these patients with LVH have an increased level of diffuse fibrosis. What's really interesting is that we have actually already conducted a preclinical study assessing the effect of uh, nitrate uh, in treating um, angiotensin 2 but also isoprenaline induced cardiac hypertrophy and this is just some of the echo data you can see quite clearly here that with nitrate treatment we've um, uh, inhibited the increase in LV mass caused by an angiotensin 2 osmotic mini pump infusion and that we reverse the um, increase in, in left ventricular wall thickness from this echo measure and um, we actually show this looks like a minor effect, but we also did a reversal treatment where the cardiac hypertrophy was induced first and then uh, we added the inorganic nitrate. And you can see that we can uh, cause a partial regression of the LV mass and this is associated with reducing wall thickness. And I can tell you that we've done a whole follow-up of mechanistic study and it's quite clear that we're impacting on fibrotic pathways as well as lowering blood pressure. And this is work that a PhD student uh, in my lab did, Lorna G. So hopefully what we've now added is that we can use dietary nitrate to vasodilate blood pressure, uh, uh, blood vessels, lower blood pressure, and in this way have an antihypertrophic, but also we now seem to see an antifibrotic effect, at least in the preclinical level. It's going to be interesting seeing what happens when we fully complete recruitment uh, in our trials. Um, just to say that inorganic nitrate doesn't always work. There are numerous studies in the literature suggesting that dietary nitrate didn't lower blood pressure in certain um, patient cohorts. There's one very recently using diet as a mechanism of elevating nitrate levels. I think there are reasons for all of these. Um, 
but just to say all the meta-analyses um, for, for all of these papers that are negative, there are several that are positive. And I think um, actually when you pick apart these papers, there are explanations for lack of efficacy. And we have a number of clinical trials currently underway that we're completing and, and actually almost all of them are near their end, including the nitrate TOD that uh, I showed you some uh, preliminary data on baseline. It's a really exciting time for the group. So in summary, I hope I've convinced you that high local concentrations of nitrite might be useful in the treatment of reperfusion injury in STEMI, that dietary nitrate uh, does attenuate the inflammatory response in atherosclerosis and potentially may be a mechanism of, of uh, an adjunctive form of preventative therapy, but that dietary nitrate also lowers blood pressure and hypertension and, and hopefully this may uh, ultimately lead to... Um, uh, benefits in the long term for some of the um, growing um, morbidity that we see in patients with hypertension with respect to heart failure and we definitely see reductions in cardiac hypertrophy and maybe even fibrosis and actually what we're doing we have a separate drug development study we're looking at novel ways to target XOR to to treat cardiovascular vascular disease many people involved in the studies I've named the majority of them as we've gone through and of course all of my funders uh, I'm happy to take questions. Thank you.